an extraordinary look at solitary confinement. Try to be normal again. Filmed over three years. You can't conduct yourself like a human being when they treat you like an animal. The story of an institution trying to change. Prison systems around the country, they are beginning to see that solitary confinement creates many more problems than it solves. To mitigate risk, you need treatment and programming. Individuals can't be locked down. They've got to be interacting. And the men trying to move beyond it. I went from the most restrictive place I've ever been to no restrictions at all. I ran away, didn't want to deal with anything. I just wanted to be me, myself, and get my head right. Last Days of Solitary. This is the main special management unit. Uh, it's a segregation unit for the state prison. Uh, and what we have here is we have the prisoners who are down here to do segregation time for disciplinary reasons. This. They are locked down 23 hours a day uh, for the most part. Uh, while they're down here, they're angry. They flood the cells. They could be upset about the littlest things, and they just turn into violence. The other thing that they uh, do from time to time is they will self-injure themselves. They can bang their heads, punch the doors with their fists, and break their hands. Or they can resort to razor blades uh, that they find, and uh, they will cut themselves. I have three windows covered right now, and one of them appears to be self-abusive. Obviously, he is because there's blood on his toilet paper. Tempted to look through the tray slot, see if I could get a visual on him, and he's got it covered with a mattress. Kid! So my only other hope before I uh, have to extract him and bring him out of there since he re refuses to talk to me or cuff up is that I can see him through the back of the window. If I can't see him from the back window, we're going to have to go in and take him out for his own safety. Is smart enough. Viewing central. He's in here. What do you mean? Stand by. Stand by. He's got it all covered. So now we have to pull him out. Bravo two two two. I can confirm extraction team. Good to go. We have a large box. Bravo two two two. Bravo two two two. Oh, 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 oh,
Alpha School Bravo 222, team are en route. Stand by, please. Monsters! This is what they create in here. Hell and monsters. And then they drop you into society and tell you, go ahead, be a good boy. This is what they create in here, monsters. You can't conduct yourself like a human being when they treat you like an animal. Copy that, 114, perfect. Spring up and look like. Open up the slot. Go way down in your bunk, face first. Okay. This place is like an insane asylum. <laughs> you can't even imagine. I don't even know how many times I've seen this tear filled with blood from these guys cutting their arms and their necks and their balls, cutting their ball sacks out, all types of crazy craziness. And uh, that's because they're stuck in here with nothing to do. <laughs> if you don't have a strong mind, this place can break you quick. A lot of guys, they don't even have reasons why. They just snap out. That's what this place does here. It makes you mean. It makes you violent. And it f***s a lot of people's heads up. This is solitary confinement. My name's Todd Michael Fickett. My prisoner number is 93262. I'm here for arson. In prison for arson. Down here makes you feel like you're being buried alive. You're someplace alive, but you're no place anybody wants you. I'm down here in solitary confinement for like six months for hitting an officer in the kitchen. That's what you get to do. Sit there and think about your thoughts all day. Pace back and forth. That's pretty much 24-7. Like you come home, I think it's twice a week for a shower. You know, you change your clothes when you want, but you know, you're still stuck in a cell every day. 
my, my, me, my, my mental state will probably go downhill like it did last time. I go pretty crazy. We're not supposed to do it, but we do it. It's kind of funny. We're just bored, we gotta have something to do. You wanna make sure that somebody's around. We can send notes, letters, medications, and uh, sometimes razor blades. How come? I got f***ing six others talking in my head smiling. Okay. Yeah. Why don't you take this stuff down? What's going on, man? Come on. Yeah. You grab yeah. the camera and come in here, please. That's what mental health you get for not doing your job. How bad are you cut? Let me see it. Let me see it. I need to get medical. Yeah. yeah. Medical. Like a lot. No. Hey, Figgy, do me a favor. Put your that towel over there on your arm, okay? Let's just at least slow that bleeding down. Okay. Hopefully next time you f***ing Hey, are you welcome to cuff up? Yeah. I don't know. Drink some of your blood, Figgy. Come on. We're going to help you. First step is we gotta get that arm taken care of, and then we can get you some help, okay? He's a pretty serious cutter. I've known Todd for quite a while now, and his history of self-injurious behavior is pretty significant. So he does a pretty good job when he does cut. So I mean, he'll he'll go right for uh, a main artery, or yeah, you know, he'll 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 tap into something that produces uh, copious amounts and, and you know puts his life at risk. So basically, right now, I'm gonna see if I can move him to one of our two cells that I have that are designated for constant watches. They have cameras built in. They got full glass doors. Yep, it's inevitable. You put us in here with nothing to do. <laughs> gonna hit the fan. Another day on the job. It's a real clean up race. Real, real stuff. Probably average about 20 of these a month, so. Last uh, year, I've become an expert on, uh, on blood, I guess. It doesn't just mop up, does it? No, it doesn't. It, it, co it coagulates. Generally, I try to saturate it with, uh, with a germicide, and then uh, I, use a, I use, a, use a sheet to mop it up, and then afterwards, I try to scrub it down.
heart goes out to everybody down here. I've been, I've been behind these doors, so I know what it's like to stay down here for years. You know, being behind these walls, they get to everybody and everybody deals with it in their own particular way. As you can imagine, someone being 18 years old in a setting like this, you know, it's not really, it does a lot with your mind. My belief is the use of segregation has its place when you have real dangers to prisoners, but from my perspective, it is overused throughout the United States. For the normal person who doesn't work in a facility like this, they're going to be thinking, if you punish him, you're going to make him better. And the reality is the exact, the exact opposite happens. Putting them in confinement and forgetting about them is essentially going to make him worse. There's no question in my mind. If I have somebody that comes in with a five-year commitment, you can have them do their whole time in segregation. Uh, but I don't want them living next to me when you release them. I think we need to make every attempt at moving them out of, of those cells and moving them into general population. I want you out on the other side of that door, because that's good for you to be on this side of the door, not that side. All right? So we got to find a way to get you out so you're not fighting with people. We have some very, very dangerous prisoners. So on the surface, it might look crazy. Uh, but the reality is 80% of these inmates are going to be hit in the street. OK, so we can either make them worse, OK, and create more victims when they go on the street, or we can rehabilitate them. I'm Adam Brula, 102817. Yeah, I've been in prison since November 28th of 2012. Got into a lot of fights in school, started drinking at 17, getting in huge fights at parties, like three on one and winning, and everybody thought I was the coolest kid, so I just kept on doing it and doing it, and then I went too far and I broke a kid's jaw in seven places with one punch. I landed me an aggravated assault. All right. Secure Bravo 101 local, secure it, please. I just went overboard. That's why I'm down here. I freaked out. I was screaming, I started punching stuff. I got maced and tackled. They're trying to say I started a riot. And they brought me down here. I've been down here two days now. I like SEG. I can handle being locked down 23 hours a day because I can read, I can write, I can do push-ups. Most of the time, I just chill. You got to relax. You can't get yourself wound up because you can't leave that room. Well, it's good to my standards. <laughs> I'm always at this window, so I like the window to be clean. My face touches it, my hands touch it. Yeah, it sucks, but I think I'm doing good.
Good. That's a good place for you to focus on. all night. I got hardcore ADD and I'm about to leave in five months. I don't know where I'm gonna go. I don't know where I'm gonna work. I don't know how I'm gonna get a car. I still got a thousand dollars to pay with no car, no job. When you settle down in your room and you really just start thinking, just bang, 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 all at once. And I need, just trying to get some medication to slow that down for now, but that's really the problem. This really kind of f***ed my head. Why are you pissed off? The f***ing with people's portions. If we just leave Brulot in segregation, he's going to become worse. Um, we're going to end up with an inmate that probably will attempt to starve himself. Um, without a doubt, at some point, begin, begin demonstrating uh, some self-abusive behavior. So now, by introducing programs, we'll work with the inmates until eventually they become less dangerous. And then we could look at moving them back to general population. Good morning, good morning. We can talk about that after. Oh, there we go. No, 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 no. I just want to get started because we only got a little bit of time. Class is going to go the same way we always go. Ain't nothing going to change for nothing. No reason. These inmates have been significantly violent and they're truly a danger to self or others. So this is going to be a slow process. We'd have Brulot initially in cuffs and shackles. After we developed a little more confidence, uh, he'd be attending the groups just in cuffs. Develop a little more confidence, he'd attend the groups without cuffs and with just one other inmate. And we would gradually work him um, so that he'd leave that group from segregation into general population, where his program would continue. So how does pride affect this? I show pride, I try to go like, too far, and I start to get hard-headed. So you go from pride into uh, do what everybody wants. Now, like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll be so much cooler if I break this guy's eye socket. I flood this <laughs> I go do it, then I go do a high risk. You gotta find a different way of dealing with your anxiety, your anger, and all that other stuff that comes with sitting in that cell all day. I don't know, I got angry, I don't think before I act. I usually don't take responsibility for myself and I just blame other people. But I'm doing this program. I'm just gonna I'm start taking one. responsibility. I'm the one f up, so. Can't be pointing the finger. That sounds, that sounds fantastic, number one, honestly. I've seen it work. I'm, I'm an absolute believer in it working. 
It is our job, to the extent that we can, to rehabilitate them so they can become successful, productive citizens in the community. My legal name is Samuel Cason. I prefer to be called Sam. I'm currently here for a Class A aggravated assault. Most of my family's been in and out of prison their whole life. Uh, I grew up around this. I first drank and smoked pot about 10 years old. By age 14, I was shooting heroin and had already done a couple uh, juvenile sentences. The first time I got in trouble, I got sent to a mental hospital. And then I got sent to a juvenile facility for a year. I spent nine months in SAG by myself when I was 16. That was the worst, you know, it was torture pretty much. I would bang my head on doors, cut myself. Um, pretty much anything I wasn't supposed to do that I could do with the very little bit I had in myself. I turned 18 and I got sent up here and pretty much spent the rest of that sentence in SAG. Me, personally, when I spend too much time inside my head, it's a dangerous thing. Cell extractions are like a game. It's our opportunity to get back to skills. They mess with one person and spend the rest of their shift doing cell extractions. Dumb as it is, the cell extractions, people cutting up is our TV, so to speak. I cut because it's my only way to escape. Obviously, being locked up, you don't have control of nothing. And cutting myself makes me feel in control. Since I came to the population, I just tried to bury myself in programs. But I don't know how any of that's gonna work out. After doing all that time in SEG, I'm not a person that likes to talk. It breaks you. When I'm inside my head too much, I get paranoid about things and ultimately get depressed. Depression's not a good thing when you're locked in your cell 23 hours a day. Solitary confinement has the most fascinating history in the United States. The United States was actually the leader in modern times of introducing solitary confinement to the world. It was actually introduced by the Quakers as a noble experiment in rehabilitation. 
There was a belief that you could put a prisoner in his own solitary cell, freed from the evil influences of modern society. And if you put them in that cell, they would become like a penitent monk, free to come close to God and to their own inner being, and they would naturally heal, heal from the evils of the outside society. It was a noble experiment, and it was an absolute catastrophe. By the 1830s, statistical evidence began to accumulate that there was an inordinate incidence of psychosis, of suicide, and that people just deteriorated. By 1890, there was major condemnation of the institution by the United States Supreme Court. And so the experiment with solitary confinement gradually diminished as uh, evidence became unmistakable that uh, this was causing disastrous psychiatric consequences. On our special segment tonight, the subject is overcrowding, prison overcrowding. The state has the nation's largest prison system and also one of the most overcrowded. Outdated, overcrowded, and near a state of crisis. With three times as many inmates. So after the Quakers experiment, in the United States abandoned the use of solitary confinement. Uh, but then in the 1970s, we began to put unprecedented numbers of people in prison and so you had terribly overcrowded conditions and prisons that looked like they were about to become out of control. Prison populations reached an all-time high in this country last month, and one prison burst under the strain. Inmates set fire to 13 buildings and then attacked prison guards. The other thing that happened is that there were increasing numbers of mentally ill prisoners coming into the prison system. Their behavior was harder to understand, it was harder to control. Prison systems didn't have the resources to properly deal with them. Marion, America's toughest prison. Conditions are so tense, officials now say the prison is in a virtual state of siege. In October 1983, two inmates already serving life sentences murdered two guards in the same cell block the same day. Well, in 1983, there were two officers uh, within 24 hours that were killed by the Aryan Brotherhood. The staff at Marion were completely demoralized. They felt that we had to do something to protect them from these inmates, and we had to do something to protect inmates from these inmates. The bureau director got involved and said, lock it down. It wasn't just a day, it wasn't a week, it was a permanent lockdown. The entire prison was locked down. That is, every man was confined to his cell to restore order. Now there is nearly one guard for every inmate. Unruly inmates can be chained to their concrete slab beds for hours, even days. The high security, the lockdown, was created out of necessity to maintain control of the inmates, confidence and protection of the staff that have to face these kinds of individuals on a daily basis. We never wavered our belief that this was a necessity. Their response to it was to employ very large-scale solitary confinement, put a ton of people in solitary, which took away opportunities for programming, opportunities for social interaction. And that model of utter total control and harsh punishment took off in the United States so that over time, We've developed more and more supermax prisons where everyone's in solitary confinement. I think segregation to a point does correct behavior. For the people who felt we were too hard or harsh, well, what alternatives did we have? What choices did we have? Our job is to protect the inmates and the staff and to allow people to get to their time and go out as respectable citizens, that type of thing. But what are you gonna do with those people who don't want that to happen? If you got a better answer, I wish we did. I always, I always said, you know, I wish we had some social medicine or a magic wand that we could use to correct people's behavior, but there's no such thing.
What we're going to do with Todd is introduce an individualized program in the mental health unit. We're going to have a clinician working with Todd until we're successful at reducing the cutting behavior. And ultimately, at the end of the day, you know, we'll look at reintegrating Todd back into the general population. We still believe that he presents a significant danger to the staff and the other inmates. Todd ended up in segregation for a very serious assault. Uh, so essentially, we need to be reassured through programming that the likelihood of him engaging in that type of behavior is significantly reduced. So next is to figure out how you're doing and plan our next steps. So fill me in. Still, still don't feel very good. Can you tell me a little bit more about uh, you feel like what does that mean? Just don't want to call. You still want to what? Just don't want to call myself. All right. I don't even knowing the guy very well, and I don't. Um, I can tell you, he doesn't enjoy this. The intent isn't to, to engender any sympathy. The intent many times is to make an officer do things. They feel totally controlled, and this is what they learn, and it's a learned behavior, is that uh, you can control others with this. Uh, but it is kind of a pathological way of control because it doesn't gain them anything. It just, just for the briefest of time, they feel some sense of control, and then, then they're left stuck again, and, and usually in worse physical shape. We're just at the beginning. He's still struggling. He's still going to have to do his seg time, and he doesn't want to do it. So there's that kid side of him that just doesn't want to have to and you can't make me kind of thing. And I'd like to help him through that process. They're gonna tell me to drink something, I'm gonna say no. And they're gonna be like, well, just give him what he wants. Education, deck of cards, and medication. Not even, not even medication I can even possibly abuse. Antidepressants, and something to slow me down. A day in this cell is like three days out there. Drag. I want my education. You're going to be getting your GED, okay? Well, I want to do some testing tomorrow. Okay. I've been trying to do anything, and I'm not going to. Okay. You can put me in the deepest. I want a GED. Absolutely. For snap. You know what? That's 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 a legitimate request. But you snapping isn't going to get it to you. What you need to do at this point is let me try to help you. I'm done. Okay. Okay. Let's go. Okay. Just for me. Look! Okay. I don't believe in nothing. is a young man. Brulot is impulsive. And essentially, he's going to have to engage in programs. He's going to have to demonstrate the behaviors that we're looking for before we're ready to reintegrate him in general population. He's going to have to show us and demonstrate to us that the likelihood of him being involved with an assault or a crime is diminished significantly. Listen, you got four months left. You stop behaving and we'll figure something out. You know, let me tell you that if you, if you put some behavior together, then we'll take a look at, at some point, moving you out of here so you can be released. I 
I'd have to say one, two, three. Yep. Yes, yeah, the third cell now. Well, right now we have an inmate that's covered his window. We can't see in. He's actually plugged his toilet, flooded the toilet out, pushed feces out the cell doors. Uh, he's covered our back window, so we can't look into the back window and see him either. So we have some concerns for what he's doing in the cell for his own safety. 10-9, burn. We have a prisoner that is boarded up on the lower border, refusing all staff orders. Uh, I do not know, but if anybody is, it'd be 611 at the end of the meal. manager, Allen, uh, will be uh, conducting and operating the extraction team. I will be assuming incident command, 10-3. Uh, Mr. Belot, how are you feeling today? Better. That's good to hear. All right. Freezing in that room. There's only the door and there's a crack in it this much. Okay. I can barely sleep down here. Mm -hmm. My mind just races and races and races. And I oh. read, I do push-ups, I eat and I jerk off. I do all I can to keep busy. All I really want to do is go to school. Mm -hmm. Leave it in like 170 days. Yep. I'm down to days now. Yep. We've got staff on board that can help you. No, I need to do. I need to go to school. And I want my GED. That's all I ask. Okay. I'm not going to go out there and scram for another job selling drugs and because I don't have no education. That's fair, okay? I told you at your door yesterday, give me a shot. Give me a chance. If I fill you full of then you do what you think you got to do, okay? And we'll do what we got to do, all right? We'll do our best to get you the help you need, okay? But I need I need you to do your part, okay? I need to keep your head screwed on straight, okay? Thanks for coming out and talking, all right? Solitary confinement is toxic to mental function. There is a particular illness that results from being in solitary confinement. It's a delirium. It's a neuropsychiatric, almost a medical, a neurologic disease. what we see in humans. We see it in animals, I mean, we see it in mammals. Now, suppose that in addition to an environment that is merely strange, we produce one that's really frightening. Dr. Harry Harlow in the 1950s did some experimentation with monkeys, studying the effect of social isolation. And one of his experiments involved taking monkeys who had been raised with other monkeys, so they were socialized and okay, and then putting them in a, what was amounted to a solitary confinement chamber. Distressed, he may die for want of love. 
you see them rocking and shaking and, and sort of ritualistic compulsive behavior and after some period of time they brought them out and put them into a cage with other animals these monkeys were massively impaired they were frightened hiding and then they would have sudden aggression uh, attacking each other. Very different behavior, very abnormal behavior. There was no recovery. These animals didn't recover from this. One of the important clinical findings, the solitary confinement, is that People deprived of an adequate level of stimulation become actually intolerant of stimulation. They overreact, they become hyper-responsive to it, and they can't stand it. That's why you see guys getting out of solitary and they just hide in their room, they just can't stand stimulation. There has been a recent study that actually showed that this is a reality in the brain. Uh, it was a study from the Balkan conflict uh, in which it looked at prisoners released from confinement and looked at their brain waves. Some of these guys had hyper-responsive reactions, had spike reactions to the visual stimulus, and they looked at who those fellows were. Semi-starvation, no. Length of time in prison, no. Beatings, no. There was only two things ever did. Head trauma to the point of unconsciousness and a period of time in solitary confinement. You lose all feeling. You become immune to everything. You're not the same after spending so much time by yourself in those conditions. I don't care who you are. You don't come out the same person. I did 11 months in the SAG unit and went from there straight home. I tried to tell my mom and everybody I didn't want anybody around. And I got home, there was five people there and I felt like there was 5,000 people there. And ultimately for my first couple months, I'd walk myself in my camper until my mom and everybody tried to explain to me I'm not in prison. I shouldn't live like that. Um, I ultimately tried to force myself to live like I was still in sick because I didn't know what to do. And then when I stopped, I was out of control. I didn't know what to do with myself. I went from the most restrictive place I've ever been to no restrictions at all. And ultimately, I ended up shooting somebody and coming back. Richard Stahersky, 29297. I was convicted of robbery, and a crime of violence, and possession of a stolen firearm. Send me here. I 
was always getting in trouble as a kid. Pretty much, I grew up around violence. And when I was real young, I was in a place for young kids who have, like, behavior problems and whatnot. And then, when I was 17, I went to a regular prison. I did most of my sentence in seg. I think it had an effect on me. Because it made me where I don't care. It doesn't bother me. Enough. And then it just progressed from there. Got out, went in. Got out, went in. Then I ended up in seg here. In 2003, I was out in population, and I stabbed an inmate 23 times. I got placed in segregation and stabbed another inmate out here in the red cages and assaulted a bunch of COs, lit a couple fires, escaped out of my cell. You name it, I've done it. And then they let me back out the population. And to be honest with you, I was worded out. Because you're in a cell 23 hours a day. You're not used to people walking behind you, talking to you real loud, and getting it out. Felt really weird. Kind of like first day at school, except like 100 times worse. You know what I mean? It's weird being around groups of people after being so segregated for so long. How you doing? You get my letter? So how are you and mom doing? I got to finally talk to my daughter for the first time ever. She actually said, hi, daddy, and I love you. So, no, it's good. Now, how did it make you feel? It made me feel like a new guy. I wouldn't say man per se, because I'm only 21, but made me feel like a new guy. Made me feel all fuzzy. Mr. Fick is somebody who tries to elicit that he's not helpable and he's just into being a nasty guy, but I don't believe that. And I've told him that. So he's sometimes tries to test me and uh, see if I can be, be brought down to believing that he's really a horrible human being. Um, no, I mean, he's too young to throw away. I like puzzles, okay, so I got one for you, Kirkley, and Griffin. I'm gonna each give you something to do. I think you're, you're gonna enjoy this. Okay. And see if you guys put it on a piece of paper. So I'm gonna get a piece of paper for you. All right. All right, let me get this piece of paper. Now we're at the puzzles time. Oh my God, I'm puzzle. Do you see how enjoyable these guys are? I mean, they really are. They, are, they, are, they don't want to be grumpy. They don't want to be upset. They want contact that's meaningful. I got a, I got a present for you. There we go. <laughs> this is a good one. No conferring with each other either. So the idea is then to see if there's a way to keep mental health in their cell without having to be there. So that we use a transitional object, something that represents me. We'll see if you got that by Monday. If you notice, I didn't just hand them pieces of paper. I made contact with each of them. We've had a, a nice interaction. So, so, and I've got them off the, the, the grumpy kinds of I'm upset and everything and reconnected with them, engaged with them. And then I'll be there to follow up with this piece, and they'll be all excited, especially if they've accomplished this thing. Now, once you go go in one direction, coming back the other way is another line. And that's what's that, yeah. The other thing that they're unaware of is the actual thing that they're working on it has clinical component attached to it that I'll be them using the next time I meet them. Because the solution has to do with other ways of looking at problems.
It's very healthy to struggle. There's so, nothing wrong with struggle. So what do you got? How does a ball go in one direction, stop, and go back in the opposite direction without touching anything at all oh. after it leaves your hands? Oh my goodness, okay. That's, you want me to tell you? Or do you want to try to figure it out? Oh, I always want to try to figure it out. We can't just bury these guys. As a psychologist, I'm looking into what's effective. What works? Why do we keep doing things that don't work or make things worse? Why don't we figure something else out? So every time I meet with them, you know, it's, it's much more of an uplifting kind of thing. We'll goof with each other. Goes in one direction, stops. Goes back in the opposite direction. Goes back in the opposite direction. Without touching anything at all. I'm not there to judge him. And I don't have him just as being this nasty kid. That's good. All he right. doesn't want to end up where he knows he's going to end up. He's a kid. Smart guy. There's no question in my mind that we're actually seeing some positive effects of what we do. Um, I can tell you that the number of fights have dropped, uh, the number of use of weapons has dropped, transports to the emergency room have dropped, the use of constant watches has dropped. So overall, it's had a positive impact, but we're just beginning. The reality is, is we're just beginning. Prison systems around the country very, very slowly beginning to see that solitary confinement is not a panacea, that in many instances it creates many more problems than it solves. It's very, very expensive, and that there are much more cost-effective and intelligent ways of addressing these problems than the supermax solitary confinement solution we've been using. The Federal Bureau of Prisons has started a review of solitary confinement at all federal prisons. Colorado, Maine, and Georgia are already scaling back. New York State has agreed to place unprecedented restrictions on the use of solitary confinement in its prisons. The president says, quote, solitary confinement has the potential to lead to devastating, lasting psychological consequences. In each place, the consequence of depopulating the segregation of supermax units has been a very positive one. It's actually resulted in an overall reduction in the amount of violence in the larger prison system, which is something no one, no one predicted. After a series of reforms, the number of Mississippi inmates in solitary confinement is down 75%. Closing Unit 32 saved Mississippi $6 million a year. Let me tell you what I think may be going on, which is that the existence of solitary confinement has allowed correctional systems to deal with problems by putting people in the hall, by sending them off to solitary confinement and never having to think it through beyond that. The absence of having that as a quick solution forces them to take a different attitude about things, to de-escalate problems before they get to be too severe, to try to get to the bottom of why it is there's conflict between prisoners. And you're gonna to get to the root of the problem. You can actually try to address the problem in the here and now, rather than saying, well, there's always Supermax. I told you I'm trying to do it the easy way, but I've been down here too long to keep playing them games. I started this sentence in 1997. Capital murder. I was a crazy young kid, 21 years old, didn't care about nothing. I've been down in isolation for about a year now. If I don't get some answers by 3 o'clock, I'm covering my window. And if I don't get good enough answers after that, they're extracting me. 
It'll be a miracle if I don't get extracted today. It will be a miracle. They're gonna be calling when my window's covered. The only way you ever get anything around here is to act up. I sit back being good for a year, ain't working. I'm getting smoke blown up my ass every which way I look. How you doing? I'm pretty pissed off. You got a couple of assaults in 17 years. How hard is it to move me? So I gotta be out of here pretty soon. Because of what you've done here, you know, we're gonna move you out very slowly, okay? What I need to know is when I move you out there, are you gonna be safe? Am I gonna be safe? You're gonna be safe. I need to know that the other inmates are gonna be safe as well. I got no plans to go after anybody, but you got me down here for a year. I'm all set with the stabbings. I'm ready to go out and, and try to enjoy myself a little bit. Okay, I'm willing to look at moving you along, but it's gonna be a while. We gotta work the process, and I'm not interested in burying you. I'm already, I'm already buried, though. I've already been down here a year. We'll evaluate it, and we'll look at moving you along. And we'll talk next week, okay? All right? Um, um. <laughs> Have a good weekend. Of last time. You might remember, I think it was page 32. You open up to 32, right? Part of that. Oh, attitude. Uh, you explained open mindedness last week and you touched on it again this week, but tell me how you see open mindedness. What is the fault of it? Why is it a problem for you? Oh, uh, I don't have too much open mindedness for the rules in here. And tell us why. There's always a reason, so let us know. Just like, because I'm a criminal and I don't like the rules that you guys have. What happens when you follow the rules? Tell us. You're not as happy. <laughs> I, honestly, I mean, you want me to tell you the truth? <laughs> All right. That program is bull. Everybody knows it. Do you want to change? Change for what? What do you change into what? <laughs> I'm here forever. There's nothing for me to change. I'm a criminal. I mean, I'm not gonna jump on the other side or anything, so I am what I am. I mean, I'm not gonna, I don't even wanna do this program. I just wanna get out of SEG. I think my character's pretty good overall. If you don't wanna change, you ain't gonna change. I'll show you my smokes. Go to the trunk, let's go to a hot one. And trade them or whatever you wanna do it. Go. Perry, right now he is doing everything we ask for him to do. He comes out and cleans. He doesn't give my staff a hard time. He does group. I don't have any problems with him. Does he want to come out? He does. Yeah. In fact, I looked at his journal book the other night. He's fully engaged in his journal. He's actually completed the first one. You're going to get my recommendation for him to go out. Yeah. Waiting for it. He's ready. You got to remember, this guy is a predator. Somebody, you got to watch everything. Um, I'm not keeping him there. If he's showing that he's behaving and doing what he needs to do, we're going to move him along. At some point, you got to give somebody a second chance. If they're doing what we're asking them to do, they're moving through the system. All right, let's do it. Yep. Waiting for it. He's ready. Yeah, he is. Yeah, I can't believe it.
leave the house for perfect time. He's in a hurry to leave. You know, he's a very dangerous individual, but our obligation is to continue to provide him with the opportunity to change. And I don't hesitate on that decision at all. All right, you got somebody got to get door. You never can tell what's going to change somebody around, whether it's a five-minute discussion or 300 hours of therapy. Essentially, I still believe that, that we can change him. I'm happy, content, but if I stab somebody and I get chipped out all over again, I really don't care. My realistic honest plan is to live as good as I can in here. That is my plans. I'm just hanging out. That's what I'm doing. Hanging out, making the best of that situation. Done trying to be good. I'm going home in 90 days. All I have to do is 90 more and I'm done. I'm going home. Yeah, my mental health diminished. Slowly but surely. It'll do it to anybody. I lasted a while. Now I just say And put me in the coldest cell of this whole prison as punishment. I don't know, this is America, not Russia. This is cold here. Yeah. <laughs> all I do is open a vein and throw blood all over myself, refuse medical attention until I get a warmer cell, make myself bleed a little bit. I need A and B responders and medical, please. Then for our primary and secondary. We've seen Adam Brulot deteriorate since he arrived in SEG. Was segregation the right place for a person like Adam? Well, you just defined why we don't like to use segregation, uh, but sometimes it's necessary. Mr. Brulot was engaged in some very, very serious behavior while he was in general population. So without a doubt, it was the right place for him. Did he spend too long in SEG? You know, that's a real hard question to answer. 
there's a lot of gray area in some of the decisions that we make. There's no exact science to any one of these guys. You have to try to figure them out as we go along. But ultimately, when we're moving him back into the general population, you know, we have to be certain that the staff are going to be safe, that the other inmates are going to be safe, and that he's going to be safe. Before you went to SEC, did you ever imagine that you would cut yourself like that? No. Never. <laughs> I didn't even know what it was. I seen a couple people doing it, so then I started doing it. I'm gonna try to be normal again. Just the routine every day gets to you. I've been down here four months, and I've gotten in trouble like 30 times. Been extracted umpteen times. It's flooded my whole room out a couple times. Just stuff to pass the time away. And I guess they don't like that. They think I'm crazy for it. But you gotta do something. We have some inmates that are incredibly dangerous, but on even those inmates, we got to work with them. We've been able to reduce our segregation population by 50%. We saved about a million dollars a year. I'm very confident that this process is going to work. And obviously, if there's any negative outcome, we're going to look at that negative outcome. But frankly, I'm absolutely convinced that what we're doing is going to work, and it is working. State police have formally charged a Maine State Prison inmate with murdering another inmate. When police say Richard Stahursky took two makeshift knives and stabbed convicted child molesters. How is it possible a murder can go unnoticed, an inmate beaten, tied up, and stabbed 87 times? Investigators say Stahursky used a piece of metal bed frame as a makeshift knife. I've been locked up a little over 14 years, and I've been in SAG a little over 12. What does that tell you? I did six years in SAG, you know what they do? They take me, put me right back out in population. Instead of integrating me out there, they just threw me out there. You know how I felt? I felt so weird just being around people. I never felt like that before. You know, you know what I mean? Just having people walk behind me, having them, it's like, I don't know. Kind of felt like real paranoid. Like, oh, is this dude going to try something? Maybe I should get him first. I've never hurt anybody that I felt that didn't deserve it. Staff members, any staff member I ever put my hands on, I didn't stab any of them. I had multiple opportunities to. I have not done that.
when I was done, I walked up to the desk. The female that was on had her back to me, threw the two shanks on the desk. And I told her, I said, I'm not here to hurt you. I held my hands up like this. I go, I'm gonna turn around, put my hands behind my back, cuff me. I turned around, put my hands behind my back, she froze up. I think she was kind of a little in shock. She just didn't know what the hell was going on. She's like, is that your blood? Is that somebody's blood? Is that yours? I said, hello, don't ask no questions. Just cuff me up, call your coat. I, I, am, am I a violent inmate? I, I can be, yes. You put me in certain situations, I am gonna be like that. That's not no secret though, anybody knows that. We take an event like that extremely seriously. But at the same time, we recognize, given that we're working with a very high risk population, that the key is not to overreact to an incident like that and change an entire system, or take a giant step backwards um, out of fear. My background is in training as a clinical psychologist. But it is an unusual situation to find a psychologist overseeing or running a prison system. And as a psychologist, I think the mission of the Department of Corrections can't just be about management or control. It's got to be about mitigating risk. And to mitigate risk, you need treatment and programming. To have treatment and programming, individuals can't be locked down. They've got to be interacting. So I think the key around that homicide, which was horrific, um, was to treat it appropriately, hold the offender accountable, but not sabotage a system that was moving in, in an appropriate direction. There's gonna be mistakes, there's gonna be missteps, there's gonna be major incidents, but I do think it's working. We're seeing a reduction in assault, and the numbers have continued to go down in the SEG unit. So that tells me that we're doing a better job at keeping people out and of getting them out sooner. I also think that we're doing a better job of equipping them when they leave so that they, they have more of a chance of being successful uh, when they return to their housing unit. But quite honestly, even as a psychologist, I'd tell you that we're never gonna compromise safety and security for the staff or for the offenders in the name of treatment. It has to be a balancing act. I do have a different attitude from two years ago. The program that I've done since I've been in prison taught me how to change my frame of mind. These groups aren't just something to occupy your mind, though. These groups are um, supposed to help you change yourself. So I can, I, can't, I can say part of it is to give me something to do, yes. Um, but these groups have also helped me see a, a better person in myself than I was before. So. Actually, going back a couple of years ago, my mind would go uh, into these little circuits where it's like, 
I'd be aggravated real quickly, or I'd be uh, going to a depression real quick like. And I've been trying to work over the past two years to uh, change that. And as of right now, I can probably tell you I will never cop again. I don't plan on it, I don't want it. Some days do I actually think back on what I did. Some days I've thought, said, hey, yeah, I wasn't only hurting me, I was hurting some of these COs. I was hurting inmates who had problems with it, just staring at the blood. I've hurt my family. I don't think it was right for me doing any of it. But like I said, the past is the past, you can't change it. So. Things just plain had to change. We just plain had to change the way we're doing business. Self-injurious behavior and segregation hadn't stopped, but we'd significantly decreased it, largely by, by just not punishing it. Um, so that was the first change in culture, that, that you know punishment doesn't work. Now it's all about treatment. How do we work together so that you get better? Great. And we will do whatever's necessary to make you better. That's very mature. You're 20? Mature. Yeah. Mature. It's not mature, it's mature. I tell everybody that. Mr. Fickett is still pretty no, young, so you still had a chance to look at some potential change for him. So do you feel the same? So he's but been sick for four times, five times, but each time he leaves, he's moved further. He's really kind of getting it. And he realizes we didn't send him a seg to, to really show him who's boss and kick him in the ass. It's, we're gonna seg because you really messed up. Uh, we, we're not gonna let you hurt people. We're not gonna let you do this. Um, that's not helpful to you as a human being. It's not gonna get you out of here. Uh, and we're gonna stop you. And we'll stop you every time. And then we're gonna move you forward again. Obviously, we know the reason why I'm down here. Three years ago, I assaulted an officer. I've done my time, okay? The past year, I was trying to move on with changing myself. I had put in for several groups to better myself, to get out to my family, to do my time. I've come from a long ways of fighting, of assaulting, cutting up, of doing stupid things to now because I'm trying to change, I'm trying to move on. Okay, what kind of programs have you done? Since I've been down here, I've done challenge program, I've done psychology incarceration, coping skill groups, and a couple of anger management groups back when I was in media. So I've done groups over the years. When was the last time you cut? Last time I cut was April 17th, 2014. Okay. I think that you're sincere in your willingness to change. Is that true? Yes, it is. Yep. And I think that you've been well behaved in the SMU since you've been down there. Yes, sir. Our decision is that you'll be referred to the structured living unit. Okay. Good outcome? That was a good outcome. All right, so don't prove us wrong. Take advantage of the programming that we have uh, for you. Yep. and um, do the best you can. Yes, sir. Okay. Good Thank luck you. and work hard, okay? Yes, sir. Thank you. Be good, be good at it. Good morning, Mr. Fickett. On a scale of one to 10, where you sit now, where do you feel that you are in terms of open-mindedness? A two? You know, while we may be willing to change and be We are creating a unit where we're putting very dangerous individuals in very close proximity and giving them a significant amount of freedom to interact. Uh, and so um, we almost have to be a little bit more on our toes that this is a high-risk population. So what you really need to do is create incentives get away from the punishment model, create the incentives that will start to keep them moving in the right direction. 
but there may be individuals that don't make it in that unit. Someone who defies the rules and decides, I don't want to get healthy. And you have to make some hard decisions sometimes that that individual might not be appropriate for that unit, and they could find themselves back in segregation. I'm happy I'm not in SEG because I've been down there so long, but as far as this being a place where you can better yourself, I think it's the exact opposite. I think it's a place that just breeds better um, criminals. In order to survive and live good, you have to kind of, you have to break rules. You have to learn how to be a better criminal so you don't get caught and you can kind of live a little bit, you know, figure out ways to make money that help you survive in here a little bit better. It is tense on the unit now, but we had a pretty severe assault where an inmate actually ended up striking another inmate with a padlock about 15 times. It made it very difficult with the number of inmates in the pod for us to secure that scene, also protect the inmates that were involved in the incident. We have some very dangerous guys in there. And putting those types of personalities all in one area it can be extremely challenging to manage. It can be extremely challenging to, to do it in a safe manner as well. Um, I'm pretty much <laughs> <laughs> Once again, I am in SEG. They're trying to tie me into that assault. It's something about uh, I'm the big factor of it all. Yeah. <laughs> You'll probably jam me up. Wouldn't surprise me. I mean, I, I expect the worst. They're going to screw me the best they can. And the best they can is keep me here for a couple, two, three, four years, whatever they decide they want to do. We locked the unit down. We searched everybody. During that search process, we discovered six inmates that had uh, tattoos DM on them, which meant deadly minds. Prisoner Perry was actually the one leading that little uh, crew, and out of the last five assaults in here, four of them were done by people with the DM tattoo. So we would have to say he's definitely influencing younger prisoners to uh, be involved in the gang and to assault other inmates. What's your opinion on Perry? Is he somebody who can change? Probably not. Probably not. I haven't seen any change in him. But that doesn't mean that we stop trying to do that. We try to give them, you know, the best chance to change you possibly can. And sometimes we're successful, sometimes we're not. You know? I can't live with minorities. There's a list of people I can't live with. I, I'm a violent person, but Monday morning, I'm getting released to the free world. This sentence is the first sentence that I haven't spent 90% of my time in and say, I've done a lot of programming. I, I, I guess it's the first sentence where I realize this isn't the life that I want to live. I mean, I've been in and, out, in and out since I was nine.
sometimes I wish I wasn't going home because the anxiety is so bad. For somebody like me that spent most of my life locked up, it's easy to say, all right, I'm going back to prison for however many years. It's not easy to go back to the streets. I definitely think that all the solitary time I've done, it's changed me. Maybe not permanently, but it won't be easy to change back. I mean, as far as functioning in the real world, I think it's affected me in extreme ways. And I was out for six months and I still couldn't go into Walmart without either being high or having a panic attack. Like, it may just be because I've spent so much time out of the real world, but my honest opinion is because it's, it's because I've spent so much time in a cell by myself. I feel like I, I still carry it, but I don't feel like it's gonna affect me as, as much as it has in the past. I don't want to come back here again. All I can do is take it one day at a time, try to do the right thing and hope that it works. been out a while now. It was kind of rough starting out. You go from a little cell and nobody around and it's just you and you look out this little window and see life go by. The, the guards go by, they go home, they come back, you're still there. And then they finally let you go. Now you're surrounded by everybody and they're all in your face. And even if they're 10 feet away from you, you're still aware of them and looking, even though they have nothing to do with you, because there's just too many people. Last time I interviewed you, I said you're going to try and be normal again. Yeah. How's try. That I think I've done an all right job, I guess. I don't know. Well, the other people, I think I'm pretty normal. At least I'm not in a home or something. Crazy people, <laughs> which I thought I'd end up at. But you definitely feel paranoid when you get out at the beginning. It was too much for me. It's way too much for me. I ran away, didn't want to deal with anything, don't think I could at the time. And I met up with my cousin Mikey and we bought a tent and some camping equipment and went out in the middle of the woods and camped there for like six months because I couldn't handle it out here. Couldn't handle getting an apartment, couldn't get a job. So I had no money, no transportation, no nothing. A week went by, we had a nice little fortress made up out there. All camoed out. And I don't know, it just makes you totally relax sitting out there. No way in hell someone's gonna show up out there unless they're lost. Don't have to answer to anybody. Me and one other person, pretty much a cellmate out in the woods. Is what we called each other, sellies. <laughs> I just wanted to be me, myself, and 
get my head right. And I couldn't do that with people around, so the woods helped. I was lost, so. Life has been pretty good to me this past year. I have a job, and I've got a place to live, and I have a girlfriend that's supportive. And the people around town have kind of forgiven me and, and know that I've changed. I'm a lot happier than before, and it feels good to go to work every day and make a paycheck. Come home and be able to relax. I've been in a relationship for a year with my girlfriend, Taylor. Definitely thinking of the future much brighter than before. I'm just hopeful. Very hopeful for him. I know he's not going to go back to jail again. I've been adamant that I don't want that to happen anyway. She tells me all the time, never go back, never go back. So that helps also. She, she supports me a lot in that category. If I go back, she'd be mad. <laughs> I know he doesn't want to either. Yeah. So that helps. The both of us don't want him to go back. I know he won't. But it helps hearing it, though. Every once in a while, you need to hear it. Seg definitely damaged me. I don't like to... I don't like to have people screaming around me at all. Cause that's all you hear in there and it's anxiety. I've never even had that before. I had to deal with that when I got out to even realize what it was. And just it leaves a scar in you that you won't forget. And you can't heal it. No matter how good you are. You can try and block it out. but it's still gonna be there. And you still think about it. You get flashbacks. Get anxiety and you gotta walk away. Just get away from people. Yesterday, the cop showed up at my door with a warrant for my arrest for unpaid fines. It's like the fourth time it happened. No matter how good I be, it happens every time. I was doing fine yesterday, nothing. It's fine. Just ate supper, laid down with my girlfriend, and then knock, knock, knock. All cops randomly bring you to jail for no reason at all. Justified reasons, anyways. All the good things I've done for what? I had to sit here and think about that all night. It's like they're still gonna come and arrest you. They're still gonna bring you to jail. I've done nothing wrong. I gotta come up with nine hundred dollars to get out of here, almost a thousand dollars. I can't pay it. There's nothing I can do about it. It's the worst part. It's 
So now I'm angry. Anxiety is going through me. I'm kind of sad because I'm crushed of all the good things I've done. It just means nothing to anybody besides me and my girlfriend. I could possibly lose my job. That's going to be damn near impossible to get again. I can't even sleep because I'm sweaty and I'm heart's racing. I can't get comfortable at all. So and I'm, I'm stuck in this pod, general population. I don't like being surrounded by people anymore. It gives me anxiety. I don't like big crowds. I think they just kept me in my own cell for so long. It's hard for me to be in general population. Can't trust anybody. I don't want to talk to anybody. I just want to sit by myself. So risk doing something stupid in here because surrounded by stupid people, you're gonna do something stupid. It's just a matter of time. It's like you have no one in here, you're lost. Surrounded by people that have no idea who you are and think they know who you're gonna be. I will fight anybody right now that comes up and bursts my bubble because I'm not in the right state of mind. Fight or flight mode. Instant anxiety, instant get the f away from me. I cannot handle this. And when is it gonna end? I don't think I'll ever be the same as before I ever went to say. Just never leave you. You don't forget it. There are certain people who are just so dangerous, and you have to respect that. They need to know, we can't afford to put you elsewhere because you will hurt people, including us if we let you out. With true psychopaths who have killed people and will do it again, I, I don't know that there is any good definitive treatment in the world that's been developed. You can get to strangle me with my tie. Mr. Stahersky, he has no problem killing them. There have been those that I've met where literally it doesn't matter. They would see you as just a hunk of whatever and, and don't recognize that when you're killing somebody, you're killing another human being. Do you think you're a psychopath? <laughs> no, I don't think I'm a psychopath. Uh, I think I made some serious, dangerous decisions in my life. I guess everybody's like, oh, man, he's real dangerous. So I can't go anywhere around here without them thinking I'm Hannibal Lecter. They don't trust me as far as they can throw me. I don't blame them. But no, I don't think I'm a psychopath. I ain't crazy. I'm just misunderstood. February 26th, so our last review with him. He was here six months, so we had a six-month review. He was first. What's the next step? We'll have a chat with him and proceed with caution. I mean, the concern is there's a lot of big players in that, in that pod right now. There are. This will be one more. Yeah, there are. I mean, we all know that. So. Yeah. We should bring uh, Stahersky up next. Okay. Stahersky. Good morning. Have a seat. You're here for your uh, review. What do you have to say? I take full responsibility for 
my actions. Okay. I'm not blaming the administration for me being in SAG. You know what I'm saying? I'm not blaming anybody for all the crimes that I committed in this facility, or the assaults. You know, I mean, that should come from, towards something, right? It does. It, it does. does. Effort and effort. So, I mean, any I, I like to know where do we go from here? You know, you know what I mean? I'm not looking for opportunities to be stuck here. My whole point is to move forward. I think we take one step at a time. And the next step is we work the case plan like we've talked about with some of this more specific programming and education. The step down the road is potential out-of-state placement at some point. But we got to go one step at a time. We're not going to make all these decisions today. This future ain't like 10 years down the line. No, it's not. It's not that. I've done a long time already in SEC here. But I guess what we've said here today is we're not quite there yet. Continue with the college education, programming, good behavior, and then we'll look at you again in six months. Okay? All right. Keep doing what you're doing. You're doing the right things. Okay? Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ultimately, over the last couple of years, we've kind of gone through our system. You find out it's a relatively small group of guys who are extremely dangerous and where you have to keep them isolated from other human beings or they'll hurt them. You got your hot pot. Right there. You have to protect the rest of the, the community. Uh, you can't just say, well, we'll try stuff out and geez, over a 10 year period, he's only killed three. You have to make sure your community is protected. So there will always be certain individuals within SEG who are just plain dangerous and should stay there. And so, the, But that's a very small number. I got arrested May 31st and been sitting here in Max ever since. Things unraveled faster than they ever have. I mean, I don't know if it's just my seg time or all the time I spent locked up, but if I feel like somebody's trying to intimidate me, it's like a switch turns on. I'm a violent felon. I'm not somebody that should ever be left to his own thoughts. Addicts feel that the drugs call their name. I feel that that razor calls my name. I still think that the best thing for me is treatment, some kind of help, because I've overanalyzed everything, and I think everybody's out to get me, and then I start cutting up. It's nobody's fault but my own. 
I'm the convict. I'm the man with the violent record. I cannot turn off the prison mentality. I know that I don't think like a normal person. and other Frontline programs, visit our website at pbs.org slash frontline. Frontline's Last Days of Solitary is available on DVD. To order, visit shoppbs.org or call 1-800-PLAY-PBS. Frontline is also available for download on iTunes. Thank you.